Uh, welcome. And, and in a sense, Stephen, welcome back to the ICA. You, uh, a moment ago when you guys were coming into this space, Stephen was ferreting around full of memories of, of, of a time here um, some time ago. Could you just maybe start with that, that memory? <laughs> Hi. Um, hello, everybody. Um, well, this is a very, very long time ago. Um, the summer of 1979, in fact, um, I um, wrote a play called American Days about um, set in a, a large record company, as they were called then, um, uh, and Anthony Sher played a, a, um, a talent scout auditioning three young singers. It was the time of punk, and um, um, large record labels were trying to sign young people. Um, and um, it, well, it had amazing cast. Um, Phil Daniels playing the lead in the house at the moment. The, the National um, was the lead singer in it. And Toy Wilcox, who was a big pop star then, um, was in it. Um, and it was, it was, yeah, it was a fantastically joyful experience, actually. <laughs> Which I raced in a few weeks, it was on almost <laughs> immediately, and it was a big hit, and it was very, it was, it was fun. Um, so, uh, yeah, fond memories of theatre here. It was a very um, a active theatre in the 70s and 80s, when a lot of famous shows were done here. Um, ma mostly by Max Stafford Clark, who then went on to run the Royal Court. So, um, it was, um, Exciting times, yeah. yeah. Some key themes there in those descriptions, though. Mm. Fine actors mm. and music. Uh, yeah. but, but, you know, although you're describing something that happened quite a while ago, those two key themes still predominate in your work. Uh, we're, we're here, in a sense, uh, because of uh, Dancing on the Edge, uh, which is uh, completing this Sunday evening. But uh, in many ways, those two themes still pertain, don't they? Fine actors and music. I want to ask you about, firstly, the, the world of sound and music in your work. Uh, in those early plays, it was perhaps um, discussed and talked of as opposed to underscored. But more latterly, certainly in your cinematic uh, vision, there is, a, there is a world of sound there. I want, I want you to describe, in a sense, the choices you make in that way. Um. Well, I mean, music obviously has been a very important part of, of the television work over the last, uh, since shooting the past in 1999. Um, my um, collaboration with the composer Adrian Johnson, who wrote the, the wonderful songs for Dancing on the Edge, as well as the, um, the um, score. Uh, and he's it's been a hugely important part of, of my work over the last um, decade and a bit. Um, I haven't used singing uh, songs much in my work uh, until Dancing on the Edge, although there have been one or two exceptions. One of one was in 1979. Um, and, uh, but it, it, it is a bit of a development, um, that. Um, and um, so, um, a, new, a new development, as it were. So, um, but I think that because my work mostly, my television and film work is mostly... Um, usually seen through um, one or two characters' points of view, that they are, um, instead of having multiple um, storylines that sort of then converge, normally you're following, in, in Dancing on the Edge, obviously following Louis Tudor, Lady Edge of Force character, and Stanley Matthew Good's character, principally the last part that went out <coughs> um, on the February 25th, um, um, you do pick up um, one or two more um, follow one or two more of the characters as it comes to a climax. But basically, it's subjective through their eyes. Now, if it's subjective, that you're leading an audience, the audience becomes the leading character in some senses when they enter a room, when they enter a situation. You're seeing it from their point of view. Then obviously, the, obviously the way it's shot becomes very, very important, but also the music is very, very um, crucial to that in leading because you become that character's sensibility, you know, is he attracted to that person? Is he un uneasy in this room or in this this bizarre picnic? You know, so um, the score becomes a very, very crucial thing. It can't just be poured onto the thing afterwards, um, irrespective of um, just much discussion between me and the composer. Um, so yeah, it's it's music is a very, very important element. A, a filmmaker <clears throat> might well receive a script and then uh, visualize that script and uh, indeed. Uh, commission a sort of storyboarding of, of that script. Uh, but you're sort of two for the price of one, really. You're, you're presenting yourself the script. And so in terms of uh, the initial visualisation, the initial uh, opening sequences, the, 
the extraordinary landscapes, the sort of trains with amazing skies or sunsets. Where does the sort of dramaturg or playwright or screenwriter stop and the filmmaker start in your creative process? Well, I, they're, they're very, um, I mean, they're sort of separate in that I, when I write, I, I see it very, very clearly. Um, and um, that's the, the, obviously, the moment of, 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 of creation, if you like. I'm, I, mean, I tend to plan things quite carefully, so I, I sort of know how it roughly going to hit end before I start. And then, and then I write it with a lot of detail, um, the book that's lying here of the screenplay. Um, and anybody that's glanced um, um, at any of my screenplays if, yeah, that will see that they there's a, a great deal of detail, but not shots in them. I don't write. <laughs> Occasionally, I write um, uh, crane, because I would use very few crane shots as a director, because I don't, because they, they, they you need, unless you've got, um, unless you're Bertolucci or you're doing a huge thing, you normally, a crane shot normally always gets cut into. I mean, I, I never understand, you know, a taxi arrives, the camera cranes up and can pop because it takes so far, or it cranes down, and it's never used in its entirety. So when I use a rare moment, when I use a crane shot, um, I, you will see it in its entirety, as an example, in Dancing on the Edge and the fireworks and you know, New Year's Eve party, the third part of that, when the, the cranes across some water and finds the characters. So... If I see that, I'll write it in. Um, but otherwise, I don't write camera shots for, um, because um, then as a director, um, um, when I start finding the locations, then I start thinking how I'm going to shoot it. But um, uh, and then I don't... I don't ever storyboard anything. I'm ne well, I can't draw, and I've never wanted to work with a storyboard artist. Um, I do plan... I do... Um, just uh, when I've directed my very first film um, for the cinema, um, which was a quarter of a century ago now or more, called Hidden City, which is about London and sort of went into tunnels and it was quite an elaborate um, visual thing for a first film. I work with a very, um, I don't think you'd mind me saying this, um, a slow um, -ish, um, a Polish DP. He was wonderful, but he wasn't quick. And I realised that um, I really had to really plan if I... I'd, Realised he, we could only do sort of twelve setups a day, which is not a lot on a, on a, on a, on a British low budget film. I mean, it's um, in Hollywood you would expect a big film you might do twelve or or ten a day, but uh, normally it's more like twenty or more, twenty one, twenty two, and three. So you can see that you had I had to plan things very carefully. So from that I always write. Um, it looks like schoolboy handwriting. I write a shot list for myself. Um, every week for the whole week's film, but I never look at it. But it's a good discipline because then you you sort of work out roughly how complicated the days are, um, and um, and um, and then I just go on because it's all I know. It's in my head, so I know. Film making, especially British television, um, is all to do with time because there's never ever enough time, especially on. Um, when you're trying to be quite ambitious visually. So you have to always, every day, ask what's yourself what's really, really important. So if um, if we take this scene now, if the really important moment is when you throw some water at me, <laughs> um, or vice versa, um, I know I'll probably do that, but I can't do that first because you'll be wet. You know, that's exactly the problem. Oh, God, it's going to take an enormous <laughs> amount of time to <laughs> dry Jeff, Jeff out. So you can't, because normally I try to do the... the the, the really important thing first, um, or nearly first, um, um, but I can't do that because you're going to you're going to be soaked and therefore it'll always go and then and upset as well. yeah yeah and then, <laughs> um, so um, so then you have to calculate roughly the time and then to, and then to, to wait and um, and but. You know, you know what's not important is us sitting down, for instance, yeah, in a white yeah. shot. That you leave to last, um, and you can rush that because it's just geography. So those sort of very practical considerations you're asking yourself all the time, um, and so, and they're grindingly, um, they grind you down. It's like having permanent mild toothache <laughs> because you never have enough time, and even after all the experience that I've had, you know, you, th you think you get used to it, you don't get used to it, and also. You know, people think, well, you, you've got to get out by seven and there's no way we can come back tomorrow. We've just got this ICA just today. So there's no <laughs> way you can go late and there's no way... Oh, they've got a performance tonight. You can't even go out to see what I mean, other people coming. So you, you're calculating on, on a very... Um, on, on a, um, a, 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 
on a quite a nasty little knife edge um, um, week after week after week. Um, but there's a certain exhilaration in, in beating that 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 um, restriction, although nobody remotely cares. <laughs> after, and what I've found is, people say, "Oh, that was a good scene." You say, well, "Yes, it was amazing because the light was going down. We had this and that, and the, this, this, this helicopter was landing the next." Field. Nobody's interested. I mean, literally, I've never found anybody that uh, people in the industry aren't interested. The audience is not interested. Even people that were there are not interested. In people, right? <laughs> so I, I think, um, you think... know, nobody's interested. So it's a sort of it's a sort of euphoria that you know it's just for you because nobody else will be remotely interested ever again and you know I think we'll move on because we're not interested <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. we're not interested I want to talk about the sort of slightly hybrid um, languages of your plays and films um, mm -hmm. by which I mean in a lot of your plays in italics we have the description slow fade fades mm -hmm. or a description of set. So there's a sort of cinematic dramaturgy that has sort of been inlaid into the very theatre-ness of your work as well. And is that a sort of an, an accidental product of just your mind and sensibility or do you see in a sense your theatre making as in some way cinematic as well? Um, well I think that um, initially um, I wrote a lot of Urban plays in my youth, um, um, most set in, in um, a lot of it set in shopping malls and and, and, and burger bars and, and it moved around discos, uh, as they were called then, and um, and you know that sort of urban world. And obviously that is that was quite filled with those plays that I wrote. Um, my place in the bush, hitting town, city sugar, spring to mind. Um, a play I wrote for the RSC called Shout Across the River. In my youth, they were all moved around quite a lot. But within that, they were very visceral, yes. you know, sort of, they weren't, uh, what I think is cinematic is when you get a lot of very short scenes, you know, and, and that is, and and um, and um, I've never written really like that. So I would have thought my work was, I mean, wouldn't seem, um, uh, you know, um, out of, you know, I mean, it, it, it sort of, in a way, um, was possibly slightly more fractured than a lot of theatre at that time, but now mm -hmm. would seem quite normal because a lot, a lot of of of, of, of new plays are like that. Um, so um, it's, it's rare that you have a long, sustained whole act in one place in yeah. in a modern play. Um, the um, um, which, of course, is what you know was true up to the end of the you know the fifties with the well-made play, etc. Um, so um, I think that I I, I would think that my plays are, you know, are sort of quite theatrical and my, hopefully my, my television film work isn't, but I think what they all share is a, a, a real interesting character um, and uh, that's really the link that I like creating vivid people, whether it's in, in the theatre or on screen, that's really the link, rather than pacing or the landscapes. Yes. And in, in 1984, with Breaking the Silence, there was a sort of junction between the urban Polyakov landscape into a, a different, uh, sort of more national-themed, thematically uh, drawn uh, narrative. And uh, was, was that a conscious decision, in a sense, to leave the urban shopping mall and the, and the disco and, and just paint bigger pictures, really, bigger themes? Uh, well, it was a it was a big change, yes. Um, but it was also written about um, that was based on my father's experiences in Russia um, as a boy. Um, he came over here in 1924 at the age of 14. My I had very my parents had children very late, and they were both born before they both obviously dead now. They were both born before the um, First World War. I didn't have I didn't have me till uh, my father was in his 40s. Um, so uh, it was quite interesting because therefore it gives me a link. Really into that because their their prime as youngish people was the thirties. I was brought up with lots of stories of the thirties. I think that's why I'm really interested in the thirties. But also, of course, I um, mean, he he, ha he was an extraordinary witness um, on history because he was in Moscow, literally overlooking a red square. They they had a flat that just bordered on red square. So he saw the October Revolution happen from his nursery window, literally. Um, something he talked about. Every week, in fact, um, often more than once a week, and, um, and my Russian granny 
um, lived to a wonderful age, um, at the, and she was at the top of the house, and she was a real white Russian, and she came over with them in 1924, when she was already uh, nearly 50, and um, so her whole life had been in Russia, and she was a great witness to, um, you know, a wonderful witness, a thrilling witness, although she never embroidered everything, all her stories were incredibly short, so she would tell me a story about seeing Tolstoy walking through Moscow, and following him as a groupie, as a young woman, because he was so famous, you know, um, and, and watching how people would react, and I would say, and then? And she said, that's it, you know, I mean, it's just this one fleeting, you know, there was never any more. Because normally people seen tours, they would go, oh, and then I sort of go to the shop, you know, or, or I talk to him, you know, but you never, ever, she never embroidered or invented. Or, um, but there was this extraordinary, obviously, a link to my granny walking behind Tolstoy down the street in Moscow is, 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 is for would be right, is such a romantic image. Um, so um, they were, and that fed into, to get back to the play, that fed into um, me wanting to write about my you know, European side, my Russian side, and um, that play, which was loosely based on my grandfather, who was an inventor, um, trying to invent the talkies um, in, in the wake of the Russian Revolution, which was was true that he had been one of the first people to record sound on film in the world, but um, and then nobody could prevent amplification, which was the thing to make it big, so you, you didn't have to listen to it on headphones. <coughs> Just <coughs> why the talkies took so long to happen from 1900 to 1925. So um, um, that was sort of true, but I fictionalised it. But there were themes of obviously displacement, of exile, and of of. Of, of, of barriers breaking down, which happened after the revolution. All those things um, were quite a change for me. And they sort of fed into my work, became more and more interested, I think, in, in Europe, um, in, 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 in the legacy of the war, of, of what happened, the legacy of the 30s. I mean, it, it became, and, and of family, and family history, and all those things, photographs, that, that started to um, become more and more dominant. Um, but interestingly, I mean, I didn't really um, write, um, um, apart from that one work where um, the characters being Jewish was mentioned, but wasn't much, not much was made of it, um, was um, till my parents died, um, or um, I didn't really write about that. And it's such a simple, <laughs> until somebody asked me, do you think that was linked? It had never actually occurred to me, such a simple thing as that. But I think it's obviously, uh, and somebody would have to, um, a psychologist or somebody would have to work out why, because I've never been remotely embarrassed or, or, or defensive or I'm proud to be Jewish, but obviously that I think because of having elderly parents, I think that and when you want to be a writer, um, um, and parents that are almost another generation up and therefore there's quite a gulf. When I was a young man, I was so forging, wanted to forge my own voice and they seemed to be from another age that you create, you don't write about things that are close to you. But what that does, and it's a sort of universal thing, I think, that people leave it too late mm. to ask their parents certain mm. things. I wish they, you know, there are all sorts of things that I wish, you know, in terms of history, um, that I wish <laughs> I could ask them. And I can't believe I didn't, um, even though my father was a wonderful raconteur. Um, so, um, but that is, I suppose, the human condition, mm. that uh, you often leave it too late. And I wrote a whole drama, my family reunion drama, Perfect Strangers, of which that was one of the main themes. Is your writing then in some way a form of sort of personal therapeutic in, in, in addressing not only national themes, international themes, but also very, very local, very, very close family stories and, and un, unanswered questions in your own life? Like, where's the balance there? Or, or not an intentional balance, maybe, but where is the balance there? Uh, well, I don't think, I mean, my work, my recent work hasn't, being very autobiographical, obviously, Dancing on the Edge is is not, except for the, 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 the that my parents were there at the time, and, and going to sort of hotels, and, and, and they met at a tea dance, that wonderful 30s phrase, a tea dance. Um, but um, apart from that link, um, um, there were more professional links to that story. In other words, Peggy Ashcroft, who um, was in my early work, um, two of my early television um, works, um, when I was in my 20s, um, was there as Desdemona. She played opposite Paul Robeson and had a famous affair with her, uh, affair with him. Um, during, uh, you know, this, this 
production that caused quite a scandal at the Savoy Theatre in 1930. And when half a century later, almost, she was, well, half a century later, she was in my work, she was still, could tell me stories about this amazing time. And, and I got to know her very well because she was in two works of mine um, um, about five years apart. Um, and, um, and so she, that was a professional link um, and something that she told me about this world more than my, my parents did. Um, but in terms of, I think that my recent work um, is, has not been very autobiographical, but it has been concerned with, um, there is obviously quite a strong European <laughs> connection or an outsider connection, clearly Louis is an outsider. And uh, my father was absolutely did not fit in. To, I mean, he was a wonderful, he was a tiny, small man, but he was incredibly, his manners were from, an, from you know, a sort of, from Russia, I mean, because the Jews were persecuted and because a lot of them were th thrown out of Moscow uh, um, just before the turn of the century, you, you, if you were from the professional classes who were allowed to stay, a lot of the Moscow Jews sort of put on, pretended to be more aristocratic than they were, or, or more upper bourgeois, to be accurate. And <laughs> so my father brought that, plus the incredible snobbish world of the <laughs> It was all encrusted on top of him, um, and uh, on, in this tiny little man. So, um, but completely fearless character, and completely individual character. Um, and, um, and the biggest influence on my life, in the sense that he, the one thing that he valued, to get his respect, the only thing that he valued, was originality. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did not really care about whether your work made money, or, <laughs> or, um, but he, you know, it, it, it was a crime if it was like something else. And um, I suppose I pursued, I mean, I tried to create, I mean, not to please him, um, purely, <laughs> I don't think, um, but, um, but um, it's interesting that that was the sort of, but that was also um, and that uh, um, the very much the spirit. If we are formed by the times that we become young adults, you know, when you know, to most people, when uh, when the, the values that they become uh, their first professional experiences often haunt you your whole life. And obviously, in the seventies, everything was trying to be original. I mean, Main Street. It was a fantastic time for mainstream American cinema, from The Godfather and. Um, you know, um, um, and Scorsese's early films. I mean, it was an incredibly rich period. I mean, it's acknowledged probably the richest period of American cinema in the 20th century. And um, and so that was what that was the mass entertainment that you went to see. You know, um, that was the bench standard. You know, these these films that have become the classics 20th century cinema. And every week there was original visions on the television. Not always brilliant, but. Mm -hmm. Every week there were two, at least two original plays. Plays that were called. That meant you know. Um, over a hundred a year by a lot of the most famous writers in the country, um, and that's as you sat down as a child. That's what you saw. So obviously you were. That was you. You thought that's what the world is. Instead, it wasn't a, a genre driven world. It was a world where you had to you had to surprise the audience. That was the benchmark, and so I suppose that has stayed with me. Your passion for the movies. I, I sort of imagine you wasting quite a few dollars in cinemas <clears throat> when you should have been studying or something. But your, your passion for the movies uh, has been much documented, and yet also there's a lamentation, you, your frustration with movie making. And it's interesting that this most recent uh, project is long-form television, five, five mm -hmm. episodes. Uh, but uh, it's not a film that's been cut up into five pieces. It's, it, they, they have uh, integrity and autonomy each episode. But uh, is, is the love, of, love affair with the filmmaker Stephen Bolyakov over now then? No, I mean, I, I, I want to make more films, but I've never really... I mean, if I could have made more films if I'd wanted to, it's, it's not been because I've been denied the chance. It's because I wanted freedom. I mean, because mm. I thought there are lots and lots of people making movies for the Americans, um, and I, um, and, which is basically what you have to do to go make a successful film even if it's purely financed, which is rare um, in Britain, purely financed by British money, you need to get an American distribution if your film is going to um, do anything. Um, um, you know, um, not, not just for America, but in Britain. So if you look at the, the British films that have been successful, they've all, um, like uh, Billy Elliot or The Full Monty or The King's Speech, they've all had huge... Amer I mean, they've had been driven and often cut by the Americans behind them. Um, so um, I didn't want that. 
um, um, because I felt there were a lot of other people doing that. I wanted to continue my work that I've done in the theatre and work in the same way in the television, which is sort of how I've been brought up. It's just described that that's how those writers... That was the world that I... When I first entered the BBC, that was the world that was surrounding you. Um, and I sort of continued working like that when it became rare and rare that you had that freedom. But I was granted for complicated reasons. Um, I was granted that freedom um, mainly because of shooting the past, because certain people wanted to recut shooting the past at the BBC at the time. I resisted it. It was very successful. So they said, oh, all right, then you were right, you know, so do the next one on the same basis. And it sort of continued like that. It's a slight simplification, but basically true. And so, um, 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 and so with that freedom to be able to make what I wanted, cast who I wanted, do what I wanted, and reach millions of people, I realised that was an incredibly lucky position to be in, and I thought I should continue until somebody stops me. Um, um, I was away from the theatre longer than I intended or wanted because this work is so time-consuming to make. When I finished one, the BBC said, OK, what's next? And, you know, you felt if you diddle around, so I'll take two years off, the executives all change and... You know, you don't get, and I, there were work that I always had new ideas to make, um, and I, I had to force myself to to um, actually do not, you know, do nothing in television or film for every year to write to get finally get back to the theatre, which I did with My City at the Almeida in uh, um, uh, um, September two thousand eleven. Um, so um, um, I don't feel in any way. Um, I wish I'd make more films, but I, I you know, I haven't. I will make, I hope, more films, but it's trying to make them um, so that they're not all cut about afterwards or, or not um, as you want. And I'd say there are very, very few British films that aren't made with the Americans being the dominant force. I mean, it's a slight exaggeration. There are always exceptions, of course, like Steve McQueen, you know, that we can think, and obviously, but the people that I admire and whose career I wanted to emulate, and I think, were people like, Mike Lee and Ken Loach, except that I've done them. I mean, they're very difficult. They don't write their own scripts. I mean, Mike Lee conjures them up, and Ken Loach works from other people's scripts. But nevertheless, they've done what they wanted, and I, I've done what I wanted, um, but mostly in, um, um, in recently in, in television. And it's been very fulfilling. <laughs> Long form has its advantages, though, doesn't it, in terms of you're able to develop a, a greater dimension of character and a greater dimension of narrative than trying to get everything squeezed into 90 minutes, you know, from, from birth to death. Yes, that that, that's a very good point. Of course, it also um, does, long-form television um, does lend itself more to my work, although I've made single films, but they've been, you know, like Friends of Crocodiles, Given to Daughter, but they were related and they made a big mm -hmm. statement together and Jay's Palace and Capturing Mary um, um, with... Um, which I made in 2007, were linked by the same house. Um, the, um, um, but it does lend itself to, to my work because of my interest in character development. Um, it's difficult to do that in a film. Um, I'm not impossible, of course, but it's difficult. And, and obviously, it, you're creating, to put it pompously, you're sort of creating sort of novels for television, mm -hmm. especially in something that's six hours long, or indeed seven extra little epilogue that's on Sunday um, and um, and so um, uh, you know and that's a great canvas you know to, to create to people that aren't just one thing you know so in the characters and dancing the edge th that you know they aren't just um, heroes and villains I mean mm. John Goodman you know has his vulnerabilities um, Anthony Head seems nice character and then it's like nothing can touch him, so if there's a villain in the piece, I suppose it's him. But it's not what you're expecting. You know, it's like in life where you get to know people and say, actually, he's not as nice as he mm. seems, you know. Mm. Um, and that's very difficult to do in a movie um, and because you can do it, especially if they're not the dominant character. You can meet them once and then, okay, they've got another side, and the, the next time you meet them, they're vicious mm. and villain. But to have that sort of subtle realisation mm. like you do in life, I mean, long-form television is, is brilliant mm. at doing that because it, 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 it's good obviously more the rhythm of, 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 of our experience that over time we accumulate extra knowledge. I'm so pleased that we're going to be uh, gifted this sort of coda on Sunday evening where an interview with uh, Louis takes place because one of the sort of delights and also frustrations I felt with that character was like you think for God's sake tell us about yourself we want to know more because he, he, he seemed to endure so silently so nobly that there was stuff that we just needed to know. And, and it does, this coda, does this little 
final uh, sort of full stop to the sequence. Um, was, was that an intentional sort of receptacle of all of that information that you just withheld? Well, I, 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 I slightly challenged that he's... No, I mean, I, I was very, very keen for him not to be the noble black man. And mm. So, I, I mean, he's quite ambitious. He doesn't fight that much for his... his guy that gets kicked out, his manager, um, which is raised in his last mm -hmm. coda, and why he didn't do more. Um, he's, he likes, uh, you know, there's sides, the sort of, not quite a social climate, but something <laughs> that is susceptible to, to praise and, 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 and adulation from these posher characters. Um, plus, he's quite, yeah, he, he's quite feisty when he has to be, like um, when he tattles um, Stanley at the beginning of part five, or when he goes for the, the sinister um, um, Sidekick of Mel Smith, um, Harry, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the Sonic before he plays at the Mason set. I mean, he tag so um, he is uh, he he is quite contained, which I think is different to um, to to Noble. I, I really didn't want another Noble black man, I, but obviously he he becomes he, his situation um, becomes such that he is in danger of becoming a victim. Mm -hmm. He's fighting hard to not to become that. Um, but he is quite tough as well. Um, the um, um, the um, in um, this last part, he's very combative and witty, and you do see a different side to him. And that one of the reasons I, I wanted to do it was to, 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 to go into things that you couldn't in the main, which is like his back, so his parents. You know, the audience just ain't interested when you're telling the main story. Um, you, you hear his parents die, but you don't want to really hear about his mum. And, you know, you think, no, please, I don't want to hear about his mum. But I would tell me the story. You know, we worry about his mum later, you know, because we don't meet his mum, so you're not interested. You know, but in this interview, you do find But once you've had the main story, I mean, this is something that television could do. I, I've done it before, a sort of little aftershock. And also, it's not just an interview. You get to hear a story within a story about the sinister fan that stalked him. And it, it does all reflect back onto the main story. And Unfortunately, the, the BBC are not telling anybody it's on, but um, you will be the audience. <laughs> and, and, was that, and was that sort of information available to the actor playing that role uh, during the, the shooting of the five, as it were? Because, you know, this is, this is like a little treasure trove of, of given circumstances and information that any actor would sort of bite your hand off for, really. Uh, well... Was it shot in post-sequence? It, was, it, it yeah. was shot right at the end, yeah. and, um, and I wrote it. Um, uh, well, I'd already written quite a lot of it, but I had to finish it over our Christmas break. Um, but I told them, uh, some of it was new um, information to them, um, but they liked that because um, um, it gave them, it sort of confirmed sort of things that they, they had been thinking. But I do do a lot of rehearsal. Um, I'm unusual in that. Um, um, I do more rehearsal, I think, than anybody else currently in British television. You're expensive, aren't you? Yeah, sort of. Uh, th I mean, say it's three. No, weeks, no, 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 it? no, no, no. It's not expensive. Rehearsal. <laughs> I just why rehearsal very, very cheap because actors just get paid rehearsal pay. Mm -hmm. they, it's all. It's all. It's rather democratic. It's all. It's all the same. So Maggie Smith gets paid the same to rehearse as an unknown act. So it's 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 it's, it's, it's a bizarre sort of equity ruling, which is very useful. And and um, and um, and so I don't know why people don't rehearse for months and months and months because um, they, because you can't get the access for that. But it's not a financial thing. It's just because a lot a lot of directors don't like being alone in a room with actors without <laughs> without the equipment and the camera and things. Um, and but because of my background in the theatre and because I I, I like actors. Um, it, 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 I, I really enjoy that part of the process, but it, there's a real reason for it because my characters are quite complicated. Their journeys are quite complex. You can't just turn up and do mm -hmm. it, and especially as everything's shot out of sequence. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a chance for the actors to ask all sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. And there's time, as I've just illustrated earlier, there is no time when you're filming. So there is time then to, for people to, to, to ask all the questions they were naturally ask in the theatre if they were doing a play. Um, and so... Um, and that is, is so it, then when you're filming, they they really know the, their parts. And I hope that's one of the reasons I'm incredibly lucky with the cast I've had over the years. But one of the reasons I think it's fair to say everybody is so extremely good in it is, um, I like to think, is my ability with actors. But it is because we rehearse and because mm -hmm. they really are confident about who they're playing by the time they start filming.
So you have the table rehearsal, you have the sort of cups of coffee and the sharpening of pencils and, and uh, the discussion of character Yeah, well, we itself. also stand it up and walk around, yeah. but do not do, we don't do the, the I don't block it um, at all because obviously we're going to be in real buildings. Mm. I let the actors do whatever, they want do whatever they want. But there's something very releasing for them to be able to play a scene standing up um, and uh, uh, so it's good because actors hate read-throughs and I never do read-throughs I mean another revolution you have to in the theatre it's just one of those things you just have to in the theatre I would like to not do them in the theatre do, but I never do read-throughs um, in this happened about 50 years ago when I worked with an actor, a young actor, who said, please, I'm so, there's such alarming company that I'm in, please, can we not do a read-through? And I said, right. I said, I expect the people who pay for it will want, so let's do little excerpts. So we did little excerpts. And uh, that's what I do. I do a sort of, I tell the actors, we'll do five or six scenes, and they know the scenes. Sometimes they know the scenes, and they, they'd say, but I, um, and then, and I just tell the audience, the people who paid for it a little bit about what links them, of course they've read the script. This is a wonderful ruse because nobody can work out how long it is, you know, because <laughs> it, it's just, you know, you get and it's delightfully slips past in an hour or so when it's six hours reduced to an hour. And, um, but um, I find that the real reason for doing that is that actors don't become incredibly mm. nervous mm. about what they're about to do because if they're sitting around, especially with... And famous actors, really, really famous actors, are as nervous, like Michael Gamble and the things, as a, 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 a new actor, um, that um, they're not being judged if they mm. sit... And so most actors, as you know, will go to read through, they're just mumble, they really, 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 I love you, I love you, I love you. I That's you. what I've written yeah, on that yeah, piece yeah, of yeah. paper. And, uh, <laughs> I love Stephen. Yeah, yeah. And so, so you know, it's 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 murder. It's it's a horrible experience. Read throughs. There's that, um, that lovely uh, story of Olivier turning up to his supposed first read through for Othello, but he was off script and in costume. You know how scary. Yes, how yes scary. I mean that that is. Well, that's a perfect example. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a bit everybody else being sort of. Why thought, Frank Fidley probably played Iago in the monotone. Yes, and he thought he was going to be yeah, encouraging yeah. the yeah. entire company, but they yeah. just felt quite sick, really. Um, we're at a point where I think it would be. Um, selfish of us to just carry on nattering because this is uh, just such a wonderful opportunity for further questions I think but not from my mind so if you have a question please raise your hand and in true question time tradition I will repeat your question before it is answered yes um, we were watching uh, Dancing on the Edge together and we noticed how wonderfully uh, new non-standard Doing a lot of rehearsal. I mean, how do you draw it out of the actors? Okay, so that's the question. So how do you draw it out of the actors? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think casting, I mean, um, many, many directors um, in the past, famous directors have said, you know, 90% of, of directing is casting um, as one of the great truisms if not cliches, and, but it is, it, it is extraordinarily true that, uh, like most cliches, uh, it is true. And so um, the, um, and, um, um, the um, casting of uh, the right person opposite, I cast Chiwetel first and then getting the right person opposite, and Matthew Good, who I was, I just always been excited by his work and what I've seen him in and I just had this idea that he could be great. Normally he plays posh parts even though he's not as posh as, he's, as often he plays. Um, and um, I, So that was the great decision. You know, He went so well with Chiwetel. And then it was finding um, the right older characters and which was quite a long search and also the, the, the crop of young talent that um, the BBC um, uh, Joanna van der Ham played um, Pamela in it um, BBC had never seen her before, and they were so thrilled they immediately put her in Paradise. Um, and um, because I had three, I was because I, I directed the whole thing myself, was working my way through editing the seven hours, and they got Paradise shot and out before we. Um, <laughs> but um, and similarly, um, you're about to see Tom Hughes in um, The Lady Vanishes, which they also made. Um, he immediately, obviously, knew Tom's work, but they got really excited about Tom. So, so all my young, the Jenna uh, Louise Coleman was cast into the new Doctor Who girl. All my young things were immediately grabbed, um, which is both a compliment, but also, um, you know, you think, oh, we thought we'd got this basket full of brilliant <laughs> fresh, and now there's all over the screen. But the, it's because the, there was, there was, you know, um, I've worked with a lot of young actors at 
crucial moments in their career. And I've worked with this brilliant casting director, Andy Pryor, and for the last fifteen years or so. And we, you know, we're very, we're quite proud of our record of of, of either spotting people, um, giving them their first roles, or, or giving them, um, you know, um, a significant role. Blunt and um, Joe Martin, we gave her first part, and Tom Hardy, we gave a significant role to Matthew McFadden, we gave him his first leading part. Um, he had played a sporting role before, to be accurate, but not not carried something, um, etc., etc. Um, um, the the, the um, um, Rebecca Hall, I worked with very early on, um, etc. This is quite a, a, a stonking list, um, and I left a lot of people out. Um, so you know, I was very, you know, we tried to find fresh women, especially um, um, to. Janet Montgomery, who's had a career in America that's not known here, um, was, you know, she was a very late find, as was Joanna. So, um, you know, it means not just going on and on and on. And, and Angel Colby, uh, on the front Fantastic. of the book, nobody knew she could sing. Not even her agent um, had heard her sing. And we saw, we had open auditions for the singers, thinking we'd find singers that could act a bit. And we ended up with two extremely experienced actors who can sing wonderfully, um, but neither of them had ever sung in... Um, Solo in public. One me myself could have been in a choir, but she in the back, but she never. So neither of them, <laughs> they they both had great voices. So um, it would have saved us a lot of time if we'd known that um, in a, a bit sooner, because we spent weeks trying to cast those girls. But um, um, so it's a search. It's 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 putting in. It's it's just if if you're very obsessive, uh, like I suppose I am, um, you just want to get it get the best people just go on and say no that's not quite right let's look for somebody else and it's just it's just a search and and also because you've had set yourself high standards by casting some brilliant people early in their careers um um that you you want to go on doing that you, you know so if you feel people aren't quite special you don't cast them <laughs> but also <laughs> casting people late in their career definitely. yes of course i mean i'm concentrating on the young ones because yes. they're they're, they're um, people that I didn't know, but obviously, I mean, you know, um, casting people against type is also something I like. Um, Tom Holland is a very good example in my show, The Lost Prince, um, playing George V. I mean, he was a very, very off the wall idea. It was my idea for that because I really, really, so George V was not, was very, not tall, it was very short, and I wanted the boy, as in he did in, in life. His, his youngest son, Johnny, which the show is about, his autistic and uh, epileptic child, to tower over him. Uh, um, and, um, and uh, you know, so I knew, and I knew Tom was a brilliant actor. Could he play George V? Well, the answer was yes, he could, but even Tom didn't think he could when we first met. And so it was just pursuing an idea to... Um, 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 obviously, Maggie Smith um, casting her not in, in such a... a, a a grand dom role, damn a role, uh, in my show Capturing Mary. She was indelibly wonderful in, and, and incredibly excited to play that. And I've never had a faster yes than, <laughs> than, than Maggie than when I sent her that script. Um, and um, so yes, Bill Nye um, playing quite serious parts for me. Um, you know, he's famed for his his suave comedy, but he, you know, he was Gideon's daughter, cast again against type, very still, and incredibly. Uh, Still with that elegance, but incredibly still. Um, so yeah, I love using actors in a different way. Um, and Mel Smith, uh, you know, is very surprising yes. and, and wonderful mm -hmm. in Dancing on the Edge. So um, that's another exciting thing to cast people against type, but not crazily, you know, not ineptly. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah I've, I've often found when watching your work, it seems to be like an otherworldly quality about it. So the question is uh, about that sort of hallucinatory world that Stephen uh, creates, both on stage but more more recently, clearly on on TV and film. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's a great question. I, I mean, I think I think it's to do with what I sort of said at the beginning that it is um, because it's viewed very much through one or two characters' eyes. I mean, all the work that I just mentioned, uh, uh, the Bill Nye piece, gives you sort of nearly. All seen through his eyes. Um, the Lost Prince is seen through the little, mostly through the little boy, well, little boy's eyes, or his brother. Um, and um, so that does give because if we, if you 
I mean, the world does appear. I mean, I as a writer, as somebody when I'm not directing, spend an awful lot of time alone in the room. I when I go out, I'm amazed because often there'll be three or four days when I've just gone and bought the paper and not really gone anywhere. I go out, I think, God, people look so extraordinary. They're so much more vivid than actors, you know. That I was on the tube, <laughs> and then I thought, I just looked at the. No doubt people were looking at me thinking just the same thing. <laughs> that, that um, in fact, we know that's true. That, that's what, that, that um, I was thinking how extras never, or supporting artists as we must call them now, extras do not look like um, as vivid as real people. I mean, it's, 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 it's just one of those things um, because people that are drawn to um, um, be supporting artists tend not to look very remarkable. <laughs> Whereas people, people, uh, unless their speciality is being the, 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 the... I hope the Evening Standard says quote that. Well, well, I don't think that's a very controversial yeah, yeah. remark. I mean, um, they, um, the, the, the point is so they can be yeah. used again and again um, as different things. Um, and, uh, um, um, but... Um, the um, but you know I, life is vivid. Um, I think that's my favourite word. Vivid. That you go out. Um, I often, as a young writer, used to go out on the street and think Dickens was right. I mean, people are you know larger than life. You know, they are extraordinary. They're not. Um, they're not um, a norm. You know, there's not a norm. And um, and so I uh, I think what I would say is that it's both that subjective quality, but it's also saying that that um, there's no such thing as naturalism. I mean, I think naturalism is, there is no such thing, because the world is not naturalistic. Um, and, and um, I mean, this, I'm just looking at this room with this, this and it's quite a bizarre, for staring, <laughs> it's quite a bizarre image, it's probably back, you know, it isn't, it isn't, um, it isn't, um, there isn't a conventional norm. And so within it, so in other words, I mean, when my, um, my daughter was born, our first child, um, as many years ago. She's just had her 20th birthday. Um, the midwife uh, at the hospital, I possibly shouldn't name even after 20 years, was smoking, first of all. Um, and she had, she had nail varnish on. And she was incredibly sort of anarchic. And I thought, my God, I never, I've never seen this on casualty. <laughs> um, ever. And I just thought, but this is reality. And yet you would never have cast her as a midwife, you know, in a million years. <laughs> Um, so, you know, this is just, it's just, that is no naturalism, you know. I think we have a glimpse of Stephen's next piece here. This is uh, amazing. And, uh, another question, please. Another question, if you have. Another question, please raise your hand. Yeah. The cheese. <laughs> okay, so a question about the character Julian, the choices that you made, and then a little sort of PS to that question about cheese. Yeah, because <laughs> how bizarre. Yeah. Well, he, he yeah, his yeah, idea is yeah. to sell English cheese yeah. to, to the um, to the French. Um, well, I um, yeah, Julian um, is um, uh, obviously he he has um, his dark side. Um, his uh, I, I, Tom and I decided it was sort of bipolar side. I mean, it was slightly suggested uh, uh, this this incredibly tragic case. John Amory, Leo Amory, was the person that um, helped get rid of Neville Chamberlain. That's why we're all here. He made the famous speech saying, um, I'm quoting Cromwell, saying it's time you left, basically, but put very, one of the most famous parliamentary speeches ever in the House of Commons. Um, at, at, um, um, just before um, he resigned in 1940. His son was a, a sort of playboy about town, um, a, quite a dangerous, charming boy. He used to have relationships mainly with prostitutes or, 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 or sort of showgirls and beat them up afterwards in a very nasty way, um, but was incredibly charming. Uh, um, but he ended up, well, it's a tragic story, was that he ended up a fascist and um, he... Um, his father, who'd helped save us by getting rid of Chamberlain, um, switched on the radio during the war and heard his own son broadcasting Nazi propaganda from Europe. And John was hung um, after the war, and Leo was... Even, they weren't even allowed to visit his grave. Um, um, it was just a horror... It's one of the most terrible stories of the war, in fact, most tragic. I just... Um, was rather haunted by that story, and at that time, this volatile boy, but I changed it around, so that instead of being a fascist, he's quite liberal, um, um, Julian, and, but he has these very cold mum, and that is absolutely um, 
true that um, you know a lot of um, not everybody, but a lot of the upper bourgeoisie and the aristocracy were, as we know, incredibly anti-Semitic and also very very cold towards their parent, their, their children. It's a very new, very new modern thing in the last quarter of a century or so. Put your children first, which is what you know. The idea that you know that um, there was this real. Um, uh, distance, um, especially amongst um, that class with their children. And so uh, that, to me, made Julian sympathetic. And also the fact that, um, but obviously he is <laughs> he's living in an alternative, you know, he's also, to use the dreadful phrase, incredibly in denial, which does happen sometimes when you've done something really, really terrible and you just say, I didn't do it. You know, the subconscious, I didn't do it. So he's not like a, a, a manipulating villain sort of trying to put all the blame on, on, on Chiwetel's character, on Louis. He is, um, um, he is somebody who's just um, uh, like that and, and just sort of completely rewritten what happened in his brain. Um, um, but that's where the character came from, from... John Amory, and then turning it around and making him more sympathetic as opposed to a fascist. I didn't want him just to be nasty and also have found it's much more interesting that he loves the band and, and is not an anti-Semite, unlike his mum. Um, as to Gars the Cheese, um, that, that I just wanted an idea um, that, that was surprising <laughs> and wasn't completely batty. Mm -hmm. And I remember, because there's a side of my family that uh, is French that went to, um, instead of coming to um, Britain, after the revolution went to France. And one of them was sitting, or rather the husband of one of them was sitting uh, in a uh, house when I was a boy. And he, was, he said he wanted to eat English cheese and he was eating all this English cheese. And he said, this cheese is amazing. <laughs> and I thought, it's just plonks of cheddar and went through them. So I thought, this is very interesting. That <laughs> I've never seen that, a Frenchman liking English cheese and thinking, it's amazing, you, sh you should tell more people about it. <laughs> so it stayed with me, that idea. And I, so it was from life. It was true, but I, yes. <laughs> it was amazing because it had traces of horse meat in it, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one last question. I think we have time for one last question. If you have uh, waiting on uh, uh, two questions for one person, yeah, yeah, yes, you. Sir. Sorry. Yes. Yes. So we would like you to orate about Stanislavski, please. Well, funny, you should, um, that does link directly to my Russian granny, who never made anything up, because she... Um, <laughs> she so did. <laughs> she's, well, you just shattered the illusion I've had for the whole of my life. She went to um, the first production of The Cherry Orchard oh, in, right. in Moscow. Sometimes, um, I think she told me it was the first night. I don't know if that's true. I don't see why she would be at the first night. She definitely was there because she described um, um, Stanislavski's, um, the place Waffles or that, I think, um, in the original, how he hugged a cupboard. She really sort of imitated the way he did it in the original. So to have somebody who was actually sitting there in the original when I was the chair and remember stage business from it um, is, um, um, was amazing. I mean, Chekhov, to me, and of course Stanislavski was so I instrumental in um, pursuing, um, helping him um, achieve finally the status he deserved in Russia, and then um, uh, was, you know, is, is probably the most profound influence as me as a writer. I mean, he is the Mozart of theatre. I don't think there's, a, outside Shakespeare, a play more perfect than Uncle Vanya. I think that's the great, for me, that's the greatest play after Shakespeare. Um, um, and, and the, you know, I mean, he is such a genius. It's like Jane Austen. He's just such a genius uh, because he, um, you able to, um, he's able to bring a character on in a few lines, suggest the complexity that they're not just one thing with such economy. Nobody's ever done that um, as well in, in 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 drama. I doubt anybody ever will. Again, um, um, as regards the method, um, which of course the legacy. Um, I have never worked with an actor that has, I mean, Jeff will know far more about this than me, but I mean, I, I mean it's a little bit discredited amongst younger actors. Um, obviously, it was this huge influence, but um, on 20th century acting, and, and especially on American acting, he's one of the most, you know, it's a huge figure. And w what he created and the influence that he had and how people interpreted his writings, whether, you know, to their own purposes, um, through... Um, 
the actor's studio, etc. Um, and um, and Lee Strasberg and all that. The Americanization of the Stanislavski is 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 one of you know it's it's, it's beyond you can't exaggerate the influence it had, um, and people reacting against it is also really interesting. Um, but um, I cannot, I, for actors it's what works, you know, I mean I think every actor, I mean some actors are so intuitive and some have to work everything out, some are really reliant on props, you know, I mean even the greatest of actors, Alec Guinness famously said until he got the shoes of the character, he couldn't play the part until he knew what shoes he wore, you know, so that's very externalised into internal, um, and other actors, so you know, the fast, I don't think, you know, they're all, um, in, I mean, what I find so interesting, why I love working with actors and why I think directing my own work gives me more ideas, keeps my energy up to create more work, is the way that acting talent renews itself. Um, again, you get young actors coming in with this incredible maturity of talent and, and, and a sense, whether it's all intellectualised or not, a sort of sense of maturity about the work, and the, you know, which is sometimes instinctive, sometimes they've worked it out quite um, methodically uh, and uh, that wonderful mix so in a sense trying you know I mean whether the you know whether his legacy is now over I don't know but I mean it's an extraordinary um, legacy um, our time not legacy but our time is just about over uh, but there is a bit of housekeep I want to um, say that this rather exquisite uh, method and drama publication with uh, photos and all uh, is uh, on sale in the Foyer, and I think Stephen's going to be scrawling across it if uh, asked very nicely. Uh, the sequence of Culture Now events, uh, is, this isn't a one-off, there is a, an extraordinary sequence of Culture Now interviews and discussions, uh, random and beautiful they are. Please do uh, check the uh, ICA brochures uh, before you leave. Uh, my name's Jeff Coleman, uh, thank you Stephen Polyakov, thank you. Thank you very much.